Hello everyone, welcome back to another Dark Souls beginner walkthrough video. So this time we're going to take a little bit of a break from the main quest, going down and hunting the lords and getting the souls and whatever, to do a couple side areas. I was hoping to do one more thing, but this video went a little longer than expected because of this boss weapon part. So first thing you're going to notice probably is that I have a lot of different stuff. Last time I think I ended with Ornstein's armor on and whatever and now I have plus nine elite knight armor and I've got some upgraded stuff, couple upgraded shields, couple upgraded weapons. I did go and farm a little bit so that I could get another titanite slab so that I could have a plus 15 longsword. But um... I spent some time before showing you guys all of this, doing some farming, getting some stuff, upgrading some stuff, because nobody wants to watch people upgrade weapons. So I got some weapons up to plus uh, 10 so that we can make boss weapons out of them, because you need the right type of weapon and it has to be plus 10 and you have to go to the giant blacksmith when they are plus 10 to make your boss weapons. And so. My character is just a little bit different. I'm wearing different rings, different armor. Um, I've upgraded some stuff that isn't going to be boss related because I was farming for stuff anyway and getting stuff anyway that I might as well go ahead and just upgrade some armor. So the Silver Knight armor is better than Ornstein's armor in pretty much every way once it's upgraded up to maximum because Ornstein's armor can't be upgraded. And the Elite Knight armor is pretty much better than both when it's near maximum. This is only at plus 9. If I wanted to have plus 10 in each piece of the armor, I would need Titanite slabs for all of that. And I wasn't going to farm Dark Wraiths for Titanite slabs, and I wasn't going to cheat so that I could have those slabs right now anyway, because I'm trying to play the game as if you have been playing the game without cheating. Now, I will say that I did cheat a little bit for boss souls because I wanted to show you each boss weapon that you can make. And this isn't all of them yet because I don't have all the boss souls, but this is going to be most of them in the game. So I cheated to get duplicates of those. That way I can show you each type. That way you can choose whatever's best for you. And I cheated so that I could get the souls quicker. If I needed souls, like for buying sorcery and stuff, I went ahead and just gave myself a lot of um, crushable souls so that I wouldn't have to go farming for souls and for items, just for items. So I farmed, got a titanite slab, and then whatever souls I needed to buy sorcery and whatever, I duplicated like a soul of a hero. And that's how I got a lot of my souls in order to pay for a lot of these weapon upgrades and the upgrade material for them too. So, other than that, um, I haven't cheated at all. I'm going to keep my stuff as if, um, you know, you weren't cheating either. So, the giant blacksmith, you give him the crystal ember we found in Duke's archives, and that's what I did. He says he makes weapons shiny. And so he can make crystal weapons when a weapon's at plus 10 now, just like he can make lightning weapons by default. And the other thing you'll see is that he's got um, this boss weapon category, and it'll tell you if you have the, the weapons ready to make into a boss weapon, what type of weapon you can make. So if you have a shield at plus 10, it'll tell you, hey, you can make the great shield of Artorius, even if you don't have the soul of, of Sif to make that yet, it'll tell you a soul of Sif will make the Great Shield of Artorius. Now, with the soul of Sif, there are three weapons you can make, or actually a shield and two weapons. So I have three copies of it. And I've got two copies of the other weapons. Ornstein's soul can only make the Dragon Slayer Spear, so there's no use in duplicating that one if you were going to duplicate it for any reason. But, um, it's 5,000 souls to upgrade, uh, your weapon into a boss weapon. 
and I didn't realize that, so I really don't have the souls to crush and get more souls to make all the boss weapons. So I do a little bit of farming for souls from the nearby enemies, so I'll speed it up when I get there. But this is me just getting enough souls to try and make all the weapons because it's 5,000 a pop just to make them. And you're going to notice when you make a boss weapon that it's probably going to suck because it's not going to be... Well, basically, you have to make a character around a weapon. That's how you do that, generally speaking. Um, even in the beginning of the game when I said, hey, think of what kind of weapon you want to make. It's because you would have to level up your character to better suit that weapon. You can throw every point into strength you want, but if you want to use a rapier, it's not going to do a darn thing to have 40 strength. It's going to do more to have 40 dexterity. So it's kind of the same thing with boss weapons, except they're more complex because they either have an added effect that is something you don't know until you make it, or it has other stats that need to be leveled up so that it can work efficiently or it's got some other thing that you don't know about so basically you have to build a character around them now you don't know what these weapons are and what they do so it's typically a new game plus thing if you're going to build around a character but anyway so first thing you'll notice in your boss section is that if you make a short sword long sword broadsword any sword even a great sword into plus 10 it'll say that you can make the great sword of artorius and if you put the broken straight sword and or the uh straight sword hilt to plus 10 it'll also say you can make the great sword of artorius those are two different great swords they don't tell you but the ones um all the other swords other than the broken straight sword and the sword hilt those make a cursed great sword of Artorius, and the sword hilt and the broken straight sword make a normal great sword of Artorius. And the difference is that one's a cursed weapon, so if you're looking to fight ghosts or something, the cursed weapon will not have an issue. You won't have to buff yourself with transient curse to kill ghosts, but that's not really worth it um, because the normal great sword has better scaling and has it, it's more designed for a character that's going to use it you can use the cursed one the same way but the stats aren't as good as the normal one so if you're gonna build a character around one of the swords build it around the normal one typically so to get the normal one again you have to use the sword hilt that you get in the very beginning of the game when you're leaving your prison cell they give you a sword hilt and that's the only weapon that you have and you can see the difference, it's kind of hard in Anne Orlando to catch the light right, but the cursed one is in my right hand, it's more black looking, and the not cursed one is in my left hand, and it's a little lighter looking. You can see the engravings on it and stuff. The black one just kind of looks more or less black, you can barely see the engravings. And they have different stats and different scaling. I think the normal one does like a magic damage based off of your intelligence and your faith. It's one of the most stat invested weapons you can get because I think it requires you to have 20 intelligence and 20 faith on top of like some strength and dexterity to use. So you have to invest heavily into it but it's supposed to be a really good weapon. I've never built a character around the weapon but there are others that have. And the cursed one is just probably the easier of the two to make. You're probably more likely to get a sword up to plus 10 than to waste the time to upgrade the sword hilt or the broken straight sword since those are worthless even when upgraded. But it's kind of cool that they have a difference. And then of course the other thing you can do is put a shield to plus 10 and use the soul of Sif to make the great shield of Artorius which has really high stability even for a great shield it's got 88 which is pretty darn good and its defensive stats are okay. It's not the best, but I don't think it's that heavy of a great shield either. So those are your three things you can make with Sif's soul. Mm. 
Now, the next thing I'm going to make, I think, is probably the swords from Quelag. So you need a scimitar or other curved sword at plus 10, or a katana at plus 10, at least plus 10, to make one of Quelag's boss weapons. So with her, you get Quelag's Fury Sword, which is a curved sword that has a fire enchantment on it. It's basically a fire scimitar. And then you have the Chaos Blade, which is a katana that does really good damage, has really good scaling, but it damages you with every hit. So it's a risk-reward thing. A lot of people use it in PvP because the damage and the reach of the katana is great. And if you can out-damage your opponent, then the, the health loss is really nothing to be too concerned about. So the Fury Sword's in my left hand, and the Chaos Blade is in my right hand. They're both about the same length. Faster, quicker, more agile builds like to use the Fury Sword because it does like flips and stuff and scimitar attacks are just faster. It's good for like catching an enemy. You do a quick slash and then he dies as a finisher thing. The Chaos Blade is more if you're planning on using that weapon mainly to attack other things. Like it's meant to be kind of a main weapon, especially in PvP. So you can use the Chaos Blade to attack somebody and then maybe you switch to another weapon to catch them off guard and to finish them. So the Fury Sword's kind of more used as a finisher weapon and then the Chaos Blade's more used as a main weapon. Not saying that you can't use it the other way around, especially when they're both upgraded, they're both pretty darn good. So, the Fury Sword, because you don't really get the right moveset if it's in your left hand, you get this fire attack. And if you do the power attack, you also get a fire attack. And you're going to get the Scimitar Kickflip instead of the normal kick that you do if you press up and R1 at the same time. But it's kind of a cool weapon. It really doesn't do that much damage. I'm going to go test it on another enemy. And you're going to see on these like Sentinel guys that are not too far, it really doesn't do that much damage. But upgrade it and it'll probably be better. Especially if you've built a character around using it. The other bad thing about collecting all these weapons is that sometimes it's pretty darn hard to find where your normal gear is, unless you've memorized the location, but I know that the crest shield and the dragon crest shield and stuff is near the bottom, just where in the shields is it? So I'm doing like 75 a hit, 76 a hit, somewhere around there. That's not too bad, but, and, and you gotta remember that this is unupgraded, so it's not great, but it, it's not terrible. If I was to take an unupgraded short sword up to the guy, it'd probably do a lot worse. But as compared to the Chaos Blade, which is a katana, which means it's got some bleeding, I can hit this guy, I might do less damage, see I do 52, and I take a little damage myself, but this also has bleeding if this guy stops hopping. That's the one thing I don't like about these sentinel guys, is that they just hop. But he's about to get hit there for some bleed, so it doesn't have to do as much damage because it's got this alternate. And again, make sure you upgrade the weapon, you know, before you really judge it. It's good. Every weapon here is going to look like it sucks because I am not built for this. 
I am not built around a katana build. If I was, then my strength would be like 15 instead of 25, and I could have that extra 10 points into dexterity, where it would scale a lot better, and I would have that maxed out. Another thing, I'm going to use Ornstein's soul to make the Dragon Slayer Spear. You're going to see I use that, and it looks so cool because Ornstein used it, and he wrecks you with it in the boss fight. You're going to see I use it, and I do like 20 damage or 50 damage with the thing. Even though everything is kind of looking good, like a C in strength, and a B in dexterity, and a B in faith. It makes it look like, hey, look, everything that you have is going to scale really nice. And it's got a special power that you can do, like, the lightning stuff with. And it does lightning damage by default. Sounds like it's an awesome weapon. But it's unupgraded, and I'm not a cleric, so I'm not really getting any of that faith scaling. So it's a B in faith, which is basically nothing for me, because I only have, like, ten. The good news is, I can use it effectively. So if I did like this weapon, if I liked the idea of it, if I liked the lightning, if I liked what it had to offer, then I could start leveling my character in a different direction to use it. That's the other thing about this game, and I guess I forgot to rest at Chamber of the Princess, so I'm back at Firelink Shrine. Um, but that's the other thing about this game, is that if you get a weapon and you can't use it, your character is not going to really show off the weapon very well. So like, if I pick up a super heavy strength weapon, which I'll do at the end of this video, I'll get a great sword that requires 50 strength. I can't even two-hand that weapon properly, so my dude is swinging it around like I've got a giant boulder on the end of it. And it makes the weapon look not very good, even though the weapon description says, hey, this has a magical super attack when used with both hands and doing the power attack. So really, you got to build a character around it. This is where PC has a advantage because if you end up getting a weapon that you really like and you don't want to level your character very much or you don't really want to waste the time to really grind so that you can use it, you can obviously cheat, give yourself some infinite souls or whatever, and level your character up to the point where you can use it effectively. Or what some people have done is, depending on how early you can get the weapon, you can cheat to get into certain areas a lot easier, or sometimes you can just cheat to give yourself the item. That usually requires a uh, cheat engine script or whatever and if you get caught using that against other people say you have a magic infused dragon slayer spear because why not this game and dark souls 2 and 3 will detect if you're using one especially the later games will detect if you're using one and kind of auto ban you so it's kind of a risky move doing that kind of stuff but you can use like a game trainer and that's a little harder to detect because all you're doing, as long as you don't do anything too crazy. Because the best thing about this game is that you can really get anywhere at any level if you're good enough. So there are people on YouTube that have done Soul Level 1 against some boss in the game. And it's not entirely impossible to beat the game without leveling up your character. Or, you know, be as low as possible. I don't know if it's soul level 1, necessarily. But, basically, be as low as possible. You can do it. It's just, it takes a tremendous amount of dodging, and if you get hit at all by even the weakest attack, you die. That kind of stuff. So they really can't ban you because there's always a chance out there of people actually succeeding and doing those crazy amazing things and getting those items as rewards. Actually, if you play now on Dark Souls, you have a very good chance early game of getting invaded by a full Dark Wraith person. He might have leveled up a couple times, but... You can, at the start of the game, as soon as you get to Firelink Shrine, head down to New Londo, 
kill the sealer guy, get the key, drain the, the thing, um, go kill Sif too for the ring, and then you can go fight the four kings, and if you survive and do it, you can join the Dark Wraiths. A lot of times people cheat because you can turn on one hit kill or infinite health or whatever you need and you know that's how they get there but um, sometimes people actually do it without cheating even on console where you really can't cheat I guess you could hack an Xbox or something but um, not a lot of people do that then I had people doing those kinds of invasions so Anyway, back to boss weapons. So, here's the Golem Axe. It'll tell you if you can use it one-handed and use the power attack that you'll do a special, like, wave wind attack. And if you remember from the fight, the Iron Golem does that in the very beginning. But even unupgraded, this axe is pretty darn good. It's pretty powerful. And then the other thing you can make with the Iron Golem core, it's because it's not a soul, you can make the Dragon Bone Fist. Now, the cool thing about this is really the moveset. The flying punch uppercut that you can do will send people back really far. Like, they'll get knocked on their back for a solid couple seconds. The problem is that fist weapons really don't have any range. So if you're trying to do this against an enemy in the game, you're more than likely going to miss your attacks. And being a fist weapon, it's even though it says it does almost 100 damage and you would think punching is pretty fast, it really doesn't have a good damage output. These aren't boss weapons, this is just Dark Hand. When I did my farming for my Titanite Slab, I got enough of these. I fed some to Frampt, but... Um, you can put a dark hand in each hand. If you block and it's in your left hand, you get a vortex shield thing. If you use a uh, left trigger while it's in your left hand, you do a parry. If you do right trigger with it in your right hand, you punch. And if you do, I'm sorry, right bumper with it, you punch. And right trigger, if it's in your hand, um, in your right hand, that is, you can grab the person and drain their humanity. So, not all weapons behave the same in each hand. So, dual wielding is kind of a possibility in this game. It's not very good, I'm gonna admit. You're not gonna see a lot of people running around with two weapons, unless it's like a curved weapon, like a curved sword or something that behaves exactly the same in the left hand as it does the right hand. Because those are typically as fast as in the right hand, so there's almost no difference. So you can do short sword followed by some curved sword attacks. In Dark Souls 2 and 3, dual wielding has gotten a lot better, so that you really don't have to worry about that too much because they've changed it enough that it will add some variety to the game. So you can very easily do a dual weapon character with no shield, especially in 2. So now I'm just kind of toying around with some of my weapons. I have this whip at plus 10, and if you're wondering why, it's because there's another boss weapon that we can make that I will make after we do the painted world with the whip. It's kind of funny. You make this weapon called the Life Hunt Scythe, and you can upgrade a halberd type weapon, or you can upgrade the whip. I don't know why the whip counts but the, it does. And the whip by itself isn't too bad. Fully upgraded, maybe buffed or something. It's not too bad, but the life hunt scythe is better. So, it's kind of weird. Usually I use the whip because I like all the halberd things that you pick up. Um, and the whip is pretty easy to get. It's early game in Blight Town, so... It's not like even if you did want to whip that it'd be too hard to get. So here's crystal weapons. You can see like short sword plus 10 goes to crystal short sword. So it goes from 156 to 171 and the, um, the damage and scaling will also go up. 
you can try some of that, but I'm not really going to focus on that too much. The Moonlight Butterfly Horn is a magic spear. So we have the Dragon Slayer Spear, which is lightning and faith-based, and then the Moonlight Butterfly Horn is a completely magic-based spear. So it's like the Moonlight Greatsword, except a spear, which is pretty cool. So... What am I looking for? Oh, shields. You can make the crystal ring shield with the moonlight butterfly soul which provides really high magic resistance and really high other elemental resistances and it'll tell you actually that if you use the special attack you can emit a crystal or a moonlight ring with the shield I don't see very many people actually use this in PvP or anything and it's kind of surprising, because I feel like it could catch people off guard. And it's not a bad shield, especially if you're against a sorcerer. You could switch to it and you get a 90% magic block. But, it doesn't really matter. It's just kind of a cool thing. I don't really use it, because I do mostly PvE for Dark Souls 1. But, I feel like it has potential. I just don't see people using it. So I think that's enough for weapons for now. I don't have the souls anyway to really go adventuring on more weapons. And I don't really have the boss souls. I can't make the Moonlight Butterfly Horn yet. And I don't have other boss souls that, um, that I can make other weapons with. So I don't have the normal souls and I don't have the boss souls. So what I'm going to do, is I'm going to go ahead and go to the Painted World. Now the Painted World is a side area, kind of hidden, kind of hard to access normally. But it's got some pretty cool stuff inside. And it's one of the best places, in my opinion, to go soul farming. Because there are a lot of weak enemies in there that die in one or two hits, especially with my weapon, that drop like anywhere from 300 to a thousand souls well the weak enemies might not drop a thousand but I think the highest that a really weak enemy in there will drop is like 500 there's one particular spot in the painted world that there's a group of enemies that you can kill with one area of effect magic attack they die really really easy it doesn't really matter what area of effect magic attack you do, just that you do one. And you can pretty much kill them all with one hit from that, and you can pretty much kill them all. So like, if you use Firestorm, that's an area of effect pyromancy. As long as the pillar hits the enemy, it pretty much dies. And you don't have to worry about it, and, it, and Firestorm can erupt like 20 pillars. So, each pillar just has to hit each guy, and I think there's like 15 guys, or maybe there's 20 guys or something. And the pillars usually hit more than one guy, too. So, in any case, it's really easy to kill them, and really easy to get the souls, and they're really close to a bonfire, which makes it a really nice run for souls. You can get an easy, like, 10,000 in a few seconds so anyway your whole goal is to obviously get to the painting if you're gonna go to the painted world you probably have to go to the giant painting that we saw when we did the Anne Orlando thing and you can run past the painted guardians I'm going to kill them because it gives me time to explain things because I get long-winded on topics and don't get to explain everything as much as I'd like to so it gives me time to explain things and it also lets you kinda slow down and listen to what I'm saying and kinda just follow along rather than look at every critical crucial step my character makes So, this 
giant ass painting here is pretty awesome but remember in order to access the painted world you must have the peculiar doll which you get from going back to undead asylum go back to your cell at the very beginning of the game and you'll find it there but you have to go to firelink shrine first then you have to take the crow back and that's where you get the doll and the doll tells you that there was once a thing that had no place in the world until it found a painting where it found like solitude and comfort and whatever. So basically there is a person in here who had this doll and they clutched to this doll to bring them comfort or whatever and when they went into the painted world they left it behind so I guess this is kind of your connection to them and that's what allows you into the painting. Kind of weird but it's cool because this is a snowy area and there aren't really any snowy areas in this game other than here and in Dark Souls 2 there's one snowy area but it's a DLC and in Dark Souls 3 there's a snowy area and that's also DLC there's really not that many snowy areas in this series, so it's different, it's cool. It's really important to note, I should have mentioned this a little earlier, that once you're in here, you're kind of stuck. But at this point in the game, you're near the end of the base game. This really shouldn't be too much of an issue for you, because everything in here should die in a few hits. It shouldn't be too difficult. If we came in here around... And Orlando, when we first got here without defeating Ornstein and Smo, then maybe this would be tougher for you. But at this point in the game, you should be strong enough that that shouldn't really be an issue. Now, you don't have to shoot that body right there. I shot it to show you that you can shoot it, but there is a way around. It's a little bit further into the area. You kind of have to open up the shortcut in this area, but um, you don't have to shoot that. You don't have to have a bow. It's also pretty important, try to have a ranged weapon or ranged magic or something because there are enemies in here these big blob guys that if you cut them open with a weapon like a sword or an arrow or a throwing knife they explode like that and if that touches you you get intoxicated which we know that toxic is much more deadly than poison so it can kill you pretty quick you can also kill them with a different type of attack. Magic, in general, just doesn't make them explode like that. So, like, I can use fire, and they'll writhe in pain. It's a different death animation. And so they don't explode open like that, and I don't get intoxicated. So either get a bow or get some magic. It'll help you out a lot. There is a method to melee weapon attacking them. You can slash them open if you get to like the very end of your reach with your weapon. You can slash at them and then quickly roll away and you can pull it off. The timing is pretty precise though. And I'll try to show it to you, but I get intoxicated twice attempting it. And then there's one time where I managed to get away. Now all throughout this painting, or at least in a couple areas in this painting, you're going to hear some of these rats. They do that weird grunting, scratching noise. That's just to tell you that these rats are down here, and I don't know why they make the weird noises, but they do. So if you hear that, don't be freaked out. They're just rats. They do a little more damage, and they drop more souls. They still have the chance of dropping humanity, so you can farm them if you want for humanity. But this item that I was looking at, there's actually this side path, which I didn't know about. I played and beat this game, did this area completely like four or five times. And then I saw a message one day in that corner 
and it told me that I could go up a staircase, and I went up the stairs, and oh my god, I was in this new area that I hadn't been to. Now, it's nothing really spectacular. You don't pick up much. I mean, you get this Soul of a Proud Knight, which is a few thousand souls, and then it's much easier to drop down to get the item on the ledge. You can also kill these crows. Now, the crows, watch out for this pecking attack that they do. This is their grab. Drains a lot of health. And they have pretty high poise for no armor or anything either. But with them, if you farm them, you can get, first of all, a thousand souls piece. That's not too bad. And then, second of all, they have a chance of dropping souvenirs of reprisal, which is what you need to upgrade in the Blades of Dark Moon. So, it's if you're trying to farm that Covenant item so that you can rank up there and get some of the rewards that they have, that's how you do it. They're the only ones that drop it. And that item on the ledge there was the Dried Finger, or Dried Fingers. They, um, it's an item you activate, it's got infinite uses, it makes you more likely to be invaded. It doesn't say that, but it does. Um, that's what it does. So, it's more from if you're, like, really trying to be invaded, maybe you have some sort of ambush, maybe you have a master plan set up. You want to lure somebody into your world, you're sitting there, you're like... I'm gonna hide behind this corner, I look exactly like a crate, or I'm hiding behind some crates, or whatever, I look like another enemy, I need a person to invade me, and then when they're least expecting it, I'm going to jump out and attack them. And then that will allow me to get the element of surprise and win a PvP battle. Or maybe you just like to get invaded, that's fine too. That item is for you in that case. Most of the time, people aren't going to use it. Now, in Dark Souls 3, they changed the function a little bit. You're more likely to get invaded, but it also allows you to summon another person for a boss fight. Which is pretty cool. It means that instead of summoning one or two people, because in the later games you can summon two people to help you with a boss fight, you can now summon three people to help you with a boss fight. Which means four people, you and three others, doing a boss means that the boss is kind of trivial. Um, they do a pretty good job, though, of altering the bosses so that their attacks are random or the boss is a lot easier to fight if it's targeted on one person, but it keeps switching targeting so it makes it more difficult. They do a good job of switching things up in later games, so that that really doesn't, um, it doesn't become too easy. It's still a lot easier than if you did it solo, but, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So, anyway, that's one of the main reasons why you want to go into the painted world in general, so there's just items you can't get anywhere else. So, like, this undead dragon that is charging at us, we can kill him, get some dragon skills, and he was guarding a blood shield and a soul. And blood shield is a shield that has really high bleeding resistance, and it actually boosts your resistances to other stats, too, just by equipping it and putting it on. So, it's a pretty cool shield. Um... A lot of people like to use it. I think I like the way it looks, so I use it. But, um... Anyway, so our goal here is to just kill this undead dragon. Arrows will take a long time. I know I can't reach it with pyromancy from here. What I like to do is bait it to breathe in that left area, and then kind of throw pyromancy or a spell or something at it until it breathes in the middle area, and then try to do the same in the left area. Or, you can sit in the left area, and then run up to it, and damage it in the middle area while it's breathing. 
it's got a very slow attack pattern. So you can run up and hit it a couple times, and it's got this delay where it still thinks you're there. And then it does, like, a biting attack. I'm nowhere near it right now, but it's trying to finish its attack animation. So, it's pretty slow. It shouldn't be too difficult. It's just about timing. So you can see him when he's moving his head over to this left side. You can just run over. You can hit him two, three times. Just watch out that you don't stay there too long, otherwise you will get bitten, and that will probably kill you or at least damage you a lot. It's pretty cool. Undead dragons are pretty rare. There's only two in the entire game. So, it's always cool to fight one, at least in my opinion. So, if you didn't grab the items, you can grab them now. Now, let's say you wandered in here by accident, you didn't know you couldn't leave, you don't want to be here anymore. You're going to see this giant thing that's still moving and alive, but it doesn't have a health bar, you can't kill it. There's actually a glitch to make this thing stand up, and then you can run underneath it and go into the boss room. And even the boss, you don't have to fight her. She'll say, hey, you're not meant to be here, just leave. And you go behind her, and then you can get out of here. So, if that's what you wanted to do, this thing here now is standing up. I'm pretty sure it's a glitch. You fall down to that ruined path, and you take it up to this tower. And there you'll find your boss and your way out. We're going to get there pretty shortly. The painted world isn't that big. It's just got a lot of, like, hidden areas where it's like, oh, well, I've already been over here, but now I can get over here a different way, and by doing that, I've grabbed a few new items. There's a lot of unique stuff in here, and there are theories about why, because the painted world is by, like, lore definition and stuff. It's a world where there's... It's kind of like the Island of Misfit toys. It's like, hey, you don't belong here, so we're gonna lock you up in this prison world called the Painted World, and you're just gonna sit in here, and you're gonna enjoy your time in here or whatever. It's not You're not meant to enjoy it, but you pretty much live there now. And so, um, all these enemies here, and all the items you find in here are, in fan theory anyway, supposed to be in here because they were frowned upon in the real world. Like that red sign soapstone. It's a twisted version of the white sign soapstone, where if you put it down, you put down an invasion sign. So somebody sees it, it's red on the ground, they go, you know what, I want to fight an invader. I'll summon him, he summons in, just as if he was a phantom, except he won't summon next to the person, because um, if they did that, you could get overwhelmed really easy. So instead, they put you in a random spot, and then the host will battle you. So, it's, it's pretty cool. You would invade their world if you placed it down, you know. All these crow enemies, they drop souvenirs of reprisal, which you get from people that are guilty. And the Dark Moon Blade Covenant, or Blades of Dark Moon, they change the name in, a, in different games, but in that covenant, they give you those as a reward for killing guilty people. So why would a bunch of crow people drop those if they weren't guilty? So, there's a lot of fun theories about this area. You'll find a lot of stuff, a lot of enemies that look weird, act weird, drop weird things. You find weird gear on various bodies. And that's the running theory, is that everything in here was shunned for some reason. And 
the boss of the area says, hey, we're all trying to be peaceful here. Like, you don't need to be here killing us. You don't need to be here riling everybody up. We live in peace without you, so go away. So, it's... It's pretty cool. I like this area. So you can see the shortcut here pretty much takes us directly to the bonfire. So if you die, that shortcut now puts you in easy range of everything else. And if you didn't shoot that rope in the very beginning like I did, you can run up here, kill these guys. Watch out for people hopping up behind you. They like to do that in this area. And you could swing your sword and cut the rope here, and then go back out front and grab the onion. These phalanx enemies, they're pretty weak. These are the weak guys I was talking about. A few arrows kills one and he drops 500 souls when you kill that one there's a lot of them and they've got this shield up and they've got their spears and really they provide pretty good defense if you shoot at them straight on like i should have hit his head but just how the enemy works is that a front on assault does not work very well unfortunately they're like a weird glob of people and you can run around them and hit them a few times and they die. So those were the enemies I was talking about. If you have an area of effect spell, more than likely you hit them and you can kill them pretty easy. So another thing, we have bone wheel skeletons again. Yay, everybody's favorite. They get really annoying, they do their spinning wheel attack and drain all your stamina if you're trying to block it and can't get out of the way. They like to trap you in corners and kill you that way. So try to go after one at a time if you can. It's pretty hard to see. It's pretty dark in this area. So just do your best, but always be on guard. And I can already tell that there are three of them because I just had two go past me and then one circle around. So I know that I have to be on the lookout for one more, and he's right there. We're gonna run over here, grab this, it's a soul, again. We're gonna grab this item here, another soul. That's an illusion wall, we'll get to that in just a second, but first, spin this lever. This is the real way to the boss. So that door opens up. And that's the way to the boss. And in this tunnel system, there are more bone wheel skeletons. So just be on guard. And don't go too fast. They can actually aggro through the other side of the illusion wall. I've had them roll and open the illusion wall for me. So at every intersection, look both ways. Sounds like driving. Look both ways and... Make your turn cautiously and all that. Put your shield up, defend. You never know what's gonna be around the corner. Around here we've got one, he's kind of hidden off to the side. So you might not see him. And he can catch you off guard. And there are some tunnels in that area that just lead to a solid dead end. There's no illusion wall, there's no other tunnel, just dead end. So you gotta be careful because in a skinny hallway like that, if you've got a horizontal swinging weapon, then you're really not going to do very well. Like here, you really can't swing your weapon very well in that tunnel. And if you get trapped back there with two or three bone wheels, you're dead. So just take your time. You can see here, I really can't get out of his way. 
So he drained a lot of my stamina. But that's okay. We managed to survive anyway. Again, you can check down here dead ends though. And if we go this way, we climb this ladder. I looked down the well earlier. I didn't go down this ladder. But if you climb up the ladder and you didn't kill the phalanxes, they might be right here waiting for you. But there are two ways into that tunnel system. And you can see here, two swings, phalanx is dead. 1,500 souls. A few swings here, phalanx is dead, 1,500 souls. A couple more swings, that's an easy 1,000 souls there. Another 1,000 souls here. Another 500 souls there. I killed a few more. So yeah, you're at about... 10,000 souls for killing all those guys, which is pretty nice. That is the easiest farming area. So, I have 37,000 souls just by running through the painted world and killing enemies. So if you need souls, if you need just spending material, you need souls to buy things. Sorcery is expensive. All spells are really expensive, especially the higher leveled up ones. Then you should come to the painted world and you should do all this because you're going to get a lot of souls and then you can figure out the best farming area for you and I like to farm those phalanxes and then that will um, basically allow you unlimited souls. You can get a couple hundred thousand in ten minutes or less. Now in this area, if you're human, you're gonna get invaded by this guy. He's King Jeremiah. He's got a really weird headpiece. And he uses a notched whip, which does bleeding. And he also uses a pyromancy flame with chaos fireball, or fire orb. I forget if it's fireball or fire orb. But you kill him pretty easy. You can get his armor set if you quit and reload, which is something I do later. Um, another thing about the painted world is that I've already picked up two new pyromancies. And that's pretty cool too. Because it, you wouldn't really think coal forested area in a painting would have pyromancy, but it does. And so, like, Fire Surge. This is basically a flamethrower. You stand in one spot, you spray fire from your hand. You got Fire Whip, Poison Mist, Acid Surge, we just picked up. That will degrade an opponent's uh, armor. I believe it's just armor. Maybe it's weapon, too, if it hits them. It's pretty useful if you're battling an enemy who really depends on their gear. If you can play Keep Away long enough, and if you have enough copies of it, or whatever you need, then you can really damage an enemy by basically breaking their gear. In PvP especially. You can see here I'm not wearing my Elite Knight Gauntlet still, because I don't have the endurance for it, so I'm wearing the black leather stuff. Just because it doesn't look bad, and I can run medium roll and stuff. But see, burn him. It's not that powerful. But Firestorm here. Boom, look at all the pillars. I killed just about every guy. And I just leveled up a couple times. I'm already back to 54,000 souls. So, you can make that farming run as many times as you want. There is a miracle if we go to Tomb of the Giants, and you will find the cleric maiden that was there earlier in the game. She was with the two other cleric guys, and they all went to the catacombs, and the guy's like, oh, I lost my lady. Well, she's in Tomb of the Giants, and if you find her and you beat... Um, beat the boss down there, then you um, can go to her and she'll sell more advanced miracles, and one of which is Wrath of the Gods, which is a really powerful miracle area of effect. So for clerics, 
I did that. I did that as a cleric. I came in here. I did Tomb of the Giants before I did Duke's Archives and before I do, did New Londo because, again, it really doesn't matter which one you choose first. But I did that, and then I came in here later, and I used Wrath of the Gods, I think, two or three times, and everybody died here. And try your hand at other pyromancies. If you really want to experiment and you want souls, come here, try it. I used Poison Mist. These guys don't have any poison resistance, so they'll die when they get poisoned to death. There is a toxic mist. I don't have access to it. It's super expensive, and you have to do something special to get to it. I will work on getting that between this video and the next video, because at the end of this video, I go ahead and do the thing that you need to do to get it. So... Then it's just a matter of buying it. It's 25,000 souls, really expensive. I don't really want to spend 25,000 souls. And I don't want to, like, cheat while I'm recording. And go ahead and get that. So, I'll probably cheat off of screen just to get the souls so that I can buy it. Because even though I just said this is a great farming area, for souls especially, let's be real, nobody wants to run around in the same area farming the same enemies for souls if they don't have to. So for the purposes of making this a little faster because videos take a couple hours to do and to upload and everything. Um, well, I'd probably say three or four hours anyway. I might as well make it as easy as possible to get my farming stuff taken care of without having to waste a couple extra hours just doing that. But if you're playing on console, for sure this area, in my opinion, is the best. It's where I always went and yeah, I highly recommend it. Or if you're playing for the first time on PC or console, doesn't really matter. If you're playing this game especially for the first time, Try not to cheat. It really takes a lot of the achievement out of the way, but there are just certain points where it's like, hey, look, it's overly expensive for some stuff. You know, it probably shouldn't cost me 50,000 souls to buy one spell from Big Hat Logan because, you know, it's an awesome spell. It's really powerful, it's really cool, but that's basically a boss fight. And so... If I'm going to defeat a boss, I'm probably going to want to spend the souls on leveling up, and I'd want to farm for the sorcery souls. So, you know, I can see sometimes if you cheat just to get some souls to buy stuff, I think that's pretty fair, especially if you've beaten the game before. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked again. So. Over in the other area, we picked up the Black Ember, which you can give to Andre, and he will make occult weapons, which you need to make a divine weapon plus five in order to make an occult weapon. Now, occult weapons, they basically hurt everything that has to do with Gwyn or Gwyn's family more than they do with... Um, other enemies. So, example, in, in Orlando, you have Sentinels, you have Silver Knights, um, the Black Knights that are scattered throughout the world. You fight Dragon Slayer Ornstein. If you attack those types of enemies who were known to be loyal to Gwyn or they protect something very important to Gwyn, you will do more damage with a cult. And it's kind of a weird enchantment. Also, Occult does more physical damage than Divine, so if you make a Divine weapon plus 10, or if you make an Occult weapon plus 5, in the end they do almost the same amount of damage, because Occult will do more physical damage, and this is without the Occult actual, like, extra damage boost factored in. Occult will do more physical damage, Divine will do more magic damage, and depending on the enemy, some may have a higher magic defense and some may have a higher physical defense where physical might be better against magical enemies and magic might be better against physical enemies. 
So, in the end, they kind of even each other out. And then, with a cult, you get the factor of there's a chance that it's going to do more damage because it's got this occult thing and you're attacking something that is weaker to a cult. So really, if I had to choose, I'd probably choose a cult because physical damage seems to be more beneficial throughout the game because there are a lot of enemies in the game that are resistant. If, if they're resistant to magic damage, they're like completely resistant to magic damage where it does so little damage it's really not effective there are also other enemies that they might not have any magic resistance and magic can just flat out own them so in my opinion I find physical just to be a little bit more effective because whatever you're fighting will always have to take physical damage even if it's heavily armored or something eventually it takes physical damage and I'd rather hit with my sword that does more physical damage two extra times than have the chance of maybe with one enemy I have to hit him, you know, one time versus every other enemy in the game I have to hit them five extra times because they're all resistant to magic. But really, it's your call depending on how you want to build your character. Try it out, see if you like it. And other things in this area do occult damage too. Um, one of the weapons we're going to get is Priscilla's dagger that does occult. Velka's rapier, which we picked up just a moment ago, has occult and it also scales with magic, which is pretty cool. Um, and then there's, you, you know, you can make occult weapons and stuff too. So, there's another weapon oh dark hand that has a cult too so um yeah it's it's kind of cool i would try it see what you like and pick your weapon from there really only for cleric builds though so you kind of have to have high faith for this thing to work out okay we also picked up just a moment ago while i was talking um, Vow of Silence, which is a miracle that you can cast that will silence enemy spellcasters. It might even silence yourself. I think it silences yourself, too, from casting spells. So, if you're finding, especially in PvP, if somebody's using a lot of spells, if that's their entire build, cast that, then they don't really have anything to fall back on. Sometimes you can get the advantage. We also picked up the Pardoner Robes which um, Oswald of Kareem, the Pardoner, he, um, he's wearing those. They're not too bad. You can basically cosplay as Oswald because he has Velka's rapier and he's wearing the like Velka priest robes or whatever they're called. And so you can basically play as him. Velka's Rapier is a really powerful magic weapon. It's by default infused with magic, which means that all you really have to do is upgrade it. And you're going to get kind of a fun weapon out of that if you're a sorcerer. I used it. I liked it anyway. I thought it was a pretty cool weapon. So give it a try. See if you like it. But basically, after you do that and you pick up the Painting Guardian stuff, we picked that up last was pretty much the last special thing that you pick up in this area you can go ahead and head towards the boss fight because there's really nothing else we can pick up at this point so we've got this giant hollow guy in steel armor he surprisingly doesn't do that much damage but I can't seem to get him to do an attack where he really leaves himself open so I just kind of R1 spam him to death because I, I really was noticing that he really wasn't doing that much damage and I didn't want to wait anymore. So this fight, we're going to fight somebody named Priscilla. And this is optional, you don't have to fight her to leave. But she's got a tail, but she also doesn't have a lot of health. So you can't really whack on her tail with your most powerful weapon because you can kill her before you end up cutting off the tail. So get a weak weapon, equip that, and then attack her tail until you cut it off. Down from the plank and hurry home. If thou 
seekest I, thine desires shall be requited not. So basically she thou says, leave. This, this is peaceful. Is its inhabitants kind, but thou dost not belong. I beg of thee, plunge down from the plague and hurry home. She really doesn't want any trouble, so you can just leave her alone. Now, I forgot to have a loading screen, which that is what's going to spawn the weird King Jeremiah armor. You gotta have some sort of loading screen, otherwise it doesn't show up, and you really don't want to run through the painted world again just to grab it. So, if you quit in a boss fight, you start outside the fog. And now switch to your weaker, or actually switch to your stronger weapon, get a couple free hits on her tail if you can. Because she'll do this blizzard, and then she's invisible. So now you can't find her tail. Which means if you go around blindly hitting her with your highest weapon, you're probably not going to hit her tail, and you'll end up killing her. So what you gotta do is hit her a few times when she's invisible, consecutively, in quick succession. And then she'll show up again. And then at that rate, just keep trying to hit her tail. With your weak weapon. You, you really shouldn't kill her as long as you're not doing a ton of damage. And you keep going for that tail. Try doing a different attack, maybe a vertical attack, like I'm going to two-hand here, a couple more hits, and you get Priscilla's Dagger. Now at this point, you can kill her, there's no point in waiting, but you can see how much my Silver Knight Straight Sword is doing, and so I didn't want to accidentally kill her before getting that. Because it's a special weapon. Not only is it a tail cutoff weapon, but it's got a cool moveset, and it's got a special bleeding effect. So, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now with her, obviously, snowy area, and you can see footprints. Look for her footprints and try and avoid her attacks. It's not that hard of a fight. Just look in the snow, see, it, um, see where she's standing, look for her footprints. Try to get behind her. If she hits you with her scythe, she will do a lot of bleeding. So just watch your bleeding and, you know, maybe back away from her or where you see her footprints if you need to, uh, if you need to not bleed as much. You can also try Blood Shield. That will also increase your bleeding resistance so that it's maybe not as big of a deal for you. At this point in the game, um, Painted World should be pretty easy for you. The only thing about it is, like I said, you can't leave until you get to this point and leave. You can't warp out even if you have the Lord Vessel. So now, we're back at Anor Londo. We're in front of the painting. All the painting guardians are back. So I'm not really going to worry about them too much. I'm just going to make a break for it. I'll kill that one there because the others didn't see me and then he won't chase me, that's one less. This one over here I'll kill with a running attack because I can one shot him that way. And then I'll just keep running. Get to the nearest bonfire you can, it's probably going to be Dark Moon Tomb. Just because that's, if you've got your thing set up the way it is, you should just be able to roll down or fall down the steps a little bit and go to the lower portion and you should be able to access this area. That is, if you went to the painting the same way I did, then it should be set up that way and it should be easy getting to here where then you can level up or do whatever. At this point, if you die, you'll come back to a bonfire which is warpable. You can warp to it, you can warp away from it, so you really shouldn't lose any progress. And, you know, set your stuff up however you want it. Probably level up your character, because odds are you're going to have a lot of souls. I'm going to start leveling up intelligence, just because um, I've gotten to the point where all my other stats are pretty much where I want them. And intelligence is probably going to be the next best bet 
just because it's going to offer some variety in spells. Because not everything is weak to fire, so sorcery is probably the next best thing if you're trying to do damage. Now, if you're trying to do healing or something, obviously miracles, because there's no healing sorcery. Plus, sorcery has a lot of effects like, hey, cast light. Now you don't have to wear something or use something special to see around in a dark area. Or repair. Now you don't have to worry about your weapons breaking or you don't have to spend souls on repairing your weapons. Or chameleon is another one. It's like, hey, now you can disguise yourself as something in the environment and hide from invaders or something. It's pretty cool. I like sorcery for that stuff. Plus you've got like remedy, which will cure you from like poison and stuff I think and toxic which makes it just like one of the best things for blight town and you get resist curse which you can cast you get fall control and um, hush so that now you can't you can fall greater distances and you can be quieter without having to have a ring on it's really useful Especially in this game. In the later games, they've added rings to add some of those effects. So the sorceries that do special things that there's no counterpart to are more effective in this game and special. So I'm going to level up intelligence. If you're going to get more into healing or you like lightning stuff, go more faith maybe. Or just continue to level up strength and dexterity or health or endurance or whatever you want really. So now that I have all these souls, I can make the Moonlight Butterfly Horn with my Partisan plus 14. I was going to save that, but I really don't want to level up a Spear to plus 10 and then come back here later to get the Moonlight Butterfly Horn. So I will just wait um, and get another Partisan sometime. I think Partisan you have to find. It doesn't really matter, I'll find it in the next game cycle. So I'll go ahead and make the Moonlight Butterfly Horn so that I have that special item. And I made the Life Hunt Scythe with my whip at plus 10. Again, if I really want a whip, I can go into Blight Town and get the whip again. There's also another whip that's a poison whip from the DLC. That's pretty cool. We'll get that when we go to the DLC. It's like the first thing you can get, so... Um... This is the Moonlight Butterfly Horn. It's a spear. It has um, complete magic damage. It doesn't say if it does a special attack, and I can't remember if it does or doesn't. I thought it did if you, like, two-hand to do a power attack. But, um, I don't know. Try it out sometime. And Life Hunt Scythe here is the scythe that Priscilla used. You'll notice that it says Bleeding 500 which is different than the other bleeding items, which say bleeding 300. It's a scythe, just like any other scythe, except it causes bleeding on enemies and it causes bleeding on yourself, which is a little bit different, which means there's a little risk because you can't just swing the scythe at things and, you know, blindly keep attacking until they bleed. But it has the life hunt effect, which... The game doesn't really explain to you too well, but basically Life Hunt, which is also found on Priscilla's Dagger, which is a curved sword, it acts like a scimitar, really it acts like the Painting Guardian curved sword, so it's like a dagger short sword, well it actually says it's a dagger, but it's kind of like a dagger scimitar combo. It's got a really cool moveset too, it's really elegant, it even says it acts like the Painting Guardians. And so all that stuff is just great. I've always liked the moveset. Anyway, both of these have um, Life Hunt on them. And Life Hunt is a different type of bleeding where instead of, you know, the 300 says, oh, 300 bleeding effect means something will bleed, it'll lose a lot of health, and then it'll have to bleed again. With Life Hunt, you get a different bleeding because when something bleeds, it loses half of its health. Half of its maximum health, or half of its current health actually, is gone when it bleeds. Which means that certain enemies, like even certain bosses, 
if you make them bleed, they will lose half of their health. And then you can continue the rest of the fight with that enemy until they're dead. So, say the stray demon in the Undead Asylum. If I ran up to it and made it bleed in three hits, it would lose half of its health in those three hits. But, um, if I do it again after that, it'll lose half of half or a quarter of its health, which is still a really good chunk of health, especially in the later game cycles. But it's only going to get decreasing from there. So, it's really better to use to get something to bleed for the first time, and then, you know, use something else for bleed if you're doing the bleeding thing. It's really cool, though. In PvP, you can make people bleed, you can use, like, a katana, and make them bleed, and get them almost up to the bleeding point, and then you can switch to a dagger or the life hunt scythe, and make the life hunt bleed happen, so that they lose half of their health. And they kind of freak out, because they're used to losing a chunk of it, but not maybe half. So, it's pretty cool. So, now I'm at Frampt, and I'm just feeding him some extra stuff that I have, so that I can get a few more souls, because I'm super close to leveling up, even after spending my souls to make uh, boss weapons. And at this point, I pretty much have the boss weapons well. I want for now. Some other time I'll have to go back to the giant and show you, like, what you can get if you kill Gwendolyn, which is something different. Um, you can make a bow and you can get a catalyst from that, and there's a couple DLC boss weapons that we'll have to get, so maybe after the DLC I'll come back and do all that, and I'll show that off. And now... After doing that, I level up, and we're going to head over to the Daughter of Chaos area, actually, because this is down in Blight Town. Basically, you want to head to Blight Town, which I think the fastest way is to go to the Daughter of Chaos bonfire. Now, we picked up a Firekeeper Soul in the Duke's archives where Logan was being held, and we can reinforce that with the Fair Lady since she's also a Firekeeper. Any firekeeper can do that. So now we're going to talk to Angie, and he will sell the servant roster. But we talked to him to get in here. We convinced him that we're a servant, even though he said, hmm, you have no eggs. And he says, oh, it doesn't matter. Whatever. Well, he is the one that sells Toxic Mist, but he's not currently selling it. And that's because... He kind of cool little side thing you can do is you can get the egg parasite that he's got and there's actually two ranks to it if you get rank one your head just gets all eggy and then you can cure that if you get to rank two you actually get a special kick and by kick I mean that you get this larva attack you don't grab the enemy but a larva shoots out of your head and damages another player. It's different. It's really not that effective, but um, you need to get the first rank, if you want to call it that. It's technically, according to wikis and stuff, it's the second rank um, of the infection. And it's where you actually grow a parasitic egg over your head, and it will unequip your helmet by default for you, and... Yeah, you can get rid of it after you talk to Angie, and he will, um, he will, uh, give you something that will just get rid of it for you and open up that ability to get the Toxic Mist. Now, all you really need to do to get it is just get grabbed, get that Parasite attack, and then you'll watch your character, and after a few minutes, your character will be scratching his head which is something that he's never done before as an idle animation. He'll just scratch his head. And he'll keep scratching his head and keep scratching his head. And then after a couple more minutes, he'll actually, like, kind of groan or grunt or whatever in pain. And then, boom, he'll have this egghead, which is really weird. And I will have the egghead for a long portion of this next part of the video 
because I don't want to warp back to the Daughter of Chaos bonfire until I'm really at a good spot. And where we're going next is the Great Hollow, and past that is a place called Ash Lake. And it's a really cool area. They're both kind of big areas. I die a couple times in the hollow because I miss a fall. And the hollow really isn't dangerous itself. Just if you try to get the items, you can tend to slide off, which is what happens to me. Now, in that segment of the video, after I die a couple times in the hollow, I left for a little bit and then got... I, well, I ended my recording, then left for a little bit, and then came back and started another recording. And for whatever reason, that recording didn't have any audio, which is just kind of weird. I don't know why it does that, but I have that happen occasionally. So, for that, fortunately, Ash Lake actually has background music, which is strange because Dark Souls doesn't have background music unless it's a boss fight or a Fire Link Shrine or unique area like that. Ash Lake actually has its own background music, and I muted my character's movements. I made him wear the slumbering dragon crest ring so that we could hear the music in the area, because I think it's pretty sweet. And so, I'll just play the soundtrack in the background at that part, and hopefully we won't really notice it. Now, near the end, where I'm warping bonfires, and I'm grabbing other things, and I'm talking to other people, Obviously, we're not going to be able to hear their dialogue, and we're not going to hear my character kind of run around. We won't hear the clacking of his armor. So, I'll play some other background music until um, the end of the video, and then next video, I won't have that sound issue. I just, I kind of want to show um, what happens when you go through this the first time. I could, in theory, run through the Great Hollow and go back through it with sound and then go through Ash Lake with sound and try to talk with other people, everybody that I talked to last time, and see if I can kind of replicate my soundless video. But there is a part where we are just going to not be able to replicate it, and I don't want you to miss out on that. I don't want to say, hey, you know, this is what's going to happen or what should happen. I want to show it to you, too. So, we'll just have to deal without the sound for the kind of, not really second half of the video, but like maybe last third of the video doesn't have sound. Really weird. I don't really get why that happens, but it happens. So, anyway, we are back in Blight Town. You've seen my character now scratching his head a couple times. So, we're getting ah, there. Truth be told. You can talk to Quailana if you have souls and stuff to upgrade your stuff. That's also something I'll probably do, too, between videos, is I'll come over to her and spend the thousands of souls it takes to upgrade your Pyromancy Flame to the Ascended version, and then that up to max, which I think is plus five. That's what I said in the last video anyway, so I hope it's true. It's been a little while since I've done that, but... Um, so... Yeah, you can talk to her and do that. I'll probably do that between videos and get that upgraded. But remember how to get to the Great Hollow. We gotta go across this way. Here's my egghead. That happened. We gotta go across the swamp. But first, we're gonna battle somebody. This is the Laurentius guy. That He's the guy that gave us the Pyromancy Flame. We told him, we said, hey, um... We got this awesome pyromancy from Quailana down in the Great Swamp area. And he was like, oh, sweet, that's awesome. I'm going to go down there and get some, too. And whatever. He's like, oh, don't worry about me. I have my pyromancy. I'm, I'm a capable pyromancer, after all. And so he ran off to come down here and learn from her. And I guess he didn't quite make it. Maybe his purpose was fulfilled or whatever you want to think. He went hollow. And typically, I want to say the theory for going hollow, like actually insane, where you attack everybody, that kind of hollow, is when you've lost a purpose. So like, your character, he's on a quest to 
overthrow Lord Gwyn to succeed him. And so, you don't go hollow because you actually have a quest to do. Now, I guess you could say the theory is that with Laurentius, his thing was you saved him, he had a debt to pay back to help you out, and then he felt satisfied. He, he um, helped you out, he got your pyromancy flame all upgraded for you, you got all his pyromancies, he really doesn't need to help you anymore. And so maybe he felt like he lost his purpose. He was going to come down here and learn more, but whatever, he went hollow. Or you could also think of the undead curse as just like everybody is on a clock, and I guess his clock ran out. His timer is gone, so he went hollow, you know, before he could learn his cool new pyromancy. So there's a crystal lizard over there. I thought there was an illusion wall in the Great Hollow that you could go through and get to that, but it's really a drop. So I spend the next, like, couple minutes as I'm descending down the hollow trying to hit various areas where I thought there was a wall, but there is no illusion wall. So, at least not in the areas I was hitting. I could have sworn there was one in here, but in the end, um, I'm not going to grab all the stuff. I'm, I'm just not going to grab everything in here because... What makes the Great Hollow kind of cool is that you go down this path and there's an upgrade material of every kind. There's white Titanite chunks, there's blue Titanite chunks, there's red Titanite chunks, there's normal Titanite chunks, and, um, you know, there's that kind of stuff. There are souls, a couple, uh, a couple different souls in this area, and so if you're looking for a particular chunk, you're looking for twinkling titanite or a normal titanite chunk or red titanite chunk and you don't want to farm it off of the enemy that drops your respective color which you can check that on the wiki from the top of my head i believe the ones that drop white titanite chunks are, is an enemy called the bone tower and that's in the tomb of the giants the ones that drop the blue titanite chunks are the crystal golems in the duke's archives near that crystal cave area and the ones that drop the red titanite chunks I believe are these weird um, insects um, I don't want to call them like maggot things but there's these weird worm things in Lost Isolith when we get there that I'll point out if I remember and those drop red titanite chunks I believe and have a chance of dropping the slab I think each one of those enemies that you can get the chunks off of also has a chance of dropping the slab. So, um, you can always check online for that stuff too. That's off of the top of my head. So, don't hold me to it. It could be wrong. So, there's that opening to get to that crystal lizard. I see it now. So, we gotta go up and get on this branch over here. Um and then drop down somehow. So we're going to drop down from here and hopefully land on that branch. And fall damage is kind of deceiving. You would think that maybe you die from that. I almost slid and fell to the next one. That might not have been good. Sometimes you can get catapulted off the edge and fall all the way down and that's how you die. That happens to me a couple times. And so now I'm looking for that opening, which is right down there. So I gotta run over here, fall down again, and then be very careful to fall and hit this lip here. Then we can run down this tunnel here. We should run into our crystal lizard, who's trying to run away. And he's gonna disappear if we don't hit him, but we got him. Twinkling Titanite, large Titanite shards. So upgrade material is pretty wild in here. You can get a lot of the stuff if you're missing it. As for where exactly each color is, I don't know. I never really come down here for the Titanite. Because I don't really do elemental weapons with my builds too often. But if you're really interested, you can check a video or the wiki. They, um, 
they often have descriptions of which item where is what kind of chunk or whatever. Don't slide and fall here, please. That's a normal Titanite chunk. So I'll try my best to pick up everything that's kind of on my way. That's why I homeward bones the first time, so that I could try to come down the hollow a different way, so that I could grab more stuff. I can already see another item I missed. Here's a soul. I'm gonna fall down here. And there are multiple ways down to get to the bottom of the Great Hollow. There's really no one set path. There's probably four to six different paths you can take. A couple paths have ladders that you go down. A couple paths have just falling. That was almost terrible. I almost died from that one. Some are worse than others. There's a falling path that's pretty straightforward. You just fall down and it's like right underneath you. No risky business. But um, there are so many different paths down. Probably the safest way is the way with the ladders, which is past the basilisks that I fought and killed. But I'm trying to go down because all your items are pretty much on the falling paths. So now, if you get to this point, you're kind of stuck. Like, you really can't fall anywhere safely. I think this is my first death around here. It's because you get there, I don't know, you, you could try to fall on that little branch. You can't really go back up. I guess you can try and roll back onto the branch you fell off of, but I tried to go there. Oh, I don't die here. I barely survive. This is where fall control would be really helpful because you would reduce the damage of your fall by a lot. But anyway, so now we're down kind of the halfway mark, if you want to call it, this big flat area. You're not down all the way. So don't think that you're like kind of good, everything's fine here, because there's more to explore yet. Somewhere around here I make a bad fall. I actually end up losing my 12 humanity, which I was pretty upset about because I made a bad fall, or I actually I got stuck in a corner by some mushroom children and mushroom parents because they're at the bottom of this thing. I got stuck in a corner and I died from them. So then I was on my way back down and I made a bad fall and I died. So I lost all my humanity, and the soul count really wasn't very high, so I didn't have to worry about it too much. But yeah, I was a little upset, just because 12 humanity, yeah, I could get some from farming, like, rats and stuff, but, um, you know, it's really, I I've kind of been enjoying having my humanity, and 12 humanity is kind of a lot. Considering that I think next time we're going to go through Lost Isolith. And there's a shortcut to Lost Isolith that if you want to save Solaire, you have to give the Chaos Servant Fair Lady Spider Chick. You have to give her... Um, oh, I almost died there. That was another almost death. You have to give her 30 humanity. And so I have 12. That's almost halfway there. And with my other singular humanity that I have, I probably could have made it, given her 30 humanity and not had to farm. But losing these 12 is going to mean that I'm going to have to farm because I just don't have enough humanity. But, you know, that, that's a different different story altogether. So you can farm rats in the depths for humanity. You can farm the Picasa in the Duke's archives for humanity. I talked about that in the Duke's archives. And then I talked about baby skeletons in Tomb of the Giants. They're an infinite source of enemy. You kill them, they have a chance of dropping humanity every time you kill them. And so that was going to be another source. It's probably the most efficient source without going into the DLC. In the DLC, 
if you get basically 80% of the way through the DLC, you can get to an area that um, has humanity phantoms, and they have a really high chance of dropping normal humanity and a very high chance of dropping twin humanity too. So a lot of times people will stock up on twin humanity, they'll just get like 30 twin humanity for their next game cycle so that they have everything they need. But anyway, your ultimate goal is try and just get to the bottom of here. I think this is where I get trapped. Yeah. So I got punched. Remember, mushroom parents are devastating. I got trapped. That mushroom child over there freaking knocked me over so I couldn't escape. And then two mushroom parents attacking at the same time, you can't block that. And they have so much health that there was no way I could have killed them. So now my video here is going to split. This will be the no sound segment. The reason why I even had to make this other segment is because I had that glitch where my guy wouldn't stand up from the bonfire. So I'll cut it to when I get to the bottom of the hollow. So in an effort to not have just nothing, I did find some music for later. For this part, the Ash Lake music is about to start, so I figured I don't need to play anything until we get there. Now, if you're anything like me, you'll really like Ash Lake, and not because there's anything really that awesome about it in terms of, like, boss fights, but area design. It's completely different from the rest of the game. You've got this more green and blue effect going on instead of, like, sharp, like, jagged edges and... Um, like maybe grays and browns and blacks and red or whatever. You get this cool lake, this cool, like, green sky kind of effect. You've got this music, which is the only area in the game with background music other than very select bonfires and stuff. And there's really not a whole lot about it not a whole lot to do. There's a new Hydra. This is the Black Hydra. It's got more heads. It does more damage. But it's really not anything super special. It's just another Hydra. And this area is huge. But there's only a small little path to walk on compared to everything. And, you know, you just pick up a few items. There's not that many enemies. It's just kind of a cool area to be in. And this music, this soundtrack, is just a completely different vibe to it. And you know what the most amazing part of it is? That they pretty much designed this to be this way. Ash Lake was always supposed to be a different kind of feeling to it. Because... In the opening cutscene, they talked about a world where it was gray and there was arch trees and it was filled with everlasting dragons and all of that. That's what this is kind of supposed to be. Ash Lake is supposed to kind of be the one part of the world before the whole age of fire and cities and humans and gods and all of that that was just left untouched. And it's got a completely different feeling to it which is really cool because if they were trying for that, they really, really hit the nail on the head. And, you know, I just think it's one of my favorite areas. You know, these clams are kind of annoying right now, and the Hydra's not really being much help. I don't really like that this clam kind of refuses to attack me normally. He keeps trying to do that attack. Which is getting really annoying, by the way. But eventually he dies. And we won't have to deal with him too much longer. Now, the thing about Ash Lake is that there's gonna be a whole bunch of dragon scales laying around here. And when you kill this black hydra, I think you get two scales. And 
So it's really just looting some unique stuff. There's one miracle down here, and um, there's a covenant, and there's a dragon weapon you can get. Plus, you get to watch the Hydra do this flying jump attack, which is pretty sweet, actually. There's nothing else in the game that does anything like that. Not even the normal Hydra. It doesn't have space to jump from large bodies of water like that. It's just a completely different area. And this Hydra that's is why Ash Lake is one of the my favorite ones. It is going to do a little bit more damage, but really, again, melee attacks are the weakest part of it. It's going to take a few more hits to cut off a head, but it shouldn't take you too long to beat. So really, same strategy, bait the head attack, go after the next, there's one down, you can either cut off all the heads or, again, take down its maximum health. I believe with this one I take down its maximum health like I did the other Hydra. This one's a little bit different though because it tries to kind of back up to do the water attack, even though it's so close to you. It you feel like it shouldn't be doing the water attack, you have to basically stand right in front of it, almost in the water, pretty much underneath it to get it to do this head attack, which is kind of annoying because the other Hydra, you just had to barely touch the water and it was fine, but this one practically stand under it. They could pretty much eat you if they wanted to, but, you know, it's still cool. You get a really good look at what the Hydra looks like anyway. So there goes another head. And again, the more heads you cut off, the harder it's going to be to actually hit the other heads. Watch your stamina though, because you'll block, like, you'll block this attack, or you'll block the water attack. And then you get over to a head and you swing a few times, you'll be out of stamina. And then if it does another attack shortly after, or another water attack like it's doing now, then you could be out of stamina and not be able to block that one. that really, you know, you think it's going to land behind you or next to like it always does, but for whatever reason, this time it decided to stick its heads over to the left of me instead of straight behind me. Like this attack, they're much closer. I don't know what the difference was, other than it was a lot closer this time. See, that's the thing. It wants you to go back far to hit its neck. But then when you do that, it does, like, the water attack instead. You barely get a couple hits in. At some point here, I just switch to a bow. It's got a few hits left. I've got only three heads left. The water attack's probably not going to hit me. It's taking too long for it to do its thing. So I'm pretty sure I just switch to a bow. I think it's after this one, yeah. I kind of try to shoot the neck, and I actually end up hitting it, surprisingly. Water attack misses, few arrows, it's dead. You get to watch the sweet Hydra death. 5,000 souls, two dragon scales, and then you just kind of follow along and loot the things that are in the area. Here is a dragon scale, which is back where the Hydra was originally, and I didn't have to make it do the jump in the water, you can totally just fight it kind of back here. I wanted to show the jump in the water because 
it's the only spot in the game where that happens. You get that dragon scale, you get the dragon scale on the log right here to the right of me. There's an item way in the distance if you're looking. And that's another scale. Or it's a soul. I can't remember. I think it's another scale. The worst part about Ash Lake, and also the best part, is it's just huge. And it has to be huge for a reason, because the dragons were huge. They needed a lot of space. The Hydra is huge. It needs a lot of space. So it makes sense. The game doesn't shrink anything down and try to make it fit to you. You just have to traverse the whole area yourself, no matter how long it takes. Which I think is really cool. Just makes your character feel real small. And then here you are still conquering everything. Even though you're just a tiny human. It's pretty cool. And so what you want to do next is you want to run into this hollow entrance. Just slide down into the entrance, kill some basilisks. There's also a mushroom parent in here. So do whatever strategy you have into beating it. I find the best thing is to look for its punch. If it takes a long wind up, then it's going to do a stronger single punch. If it's a quicker punch, then it's going to do two. Like, that one's a little quicker. Here comes a second. I hit it a few more times. That one's quicker. Here comes a second one. And now it's dead. The wind-up is kind of hard to notice. But if you have a very keen eye, you should be able to see when it cocks its arm back for a longer period of time. The large one punch is more devastating than the two smaller ones. And I say that because it hits you for full damage. Usually with the two smaller ones, you get knocked back on the first small one, and then the second one misses you. But if both small ones happen to hit you for some reason, then it can be pretty devastating too. So your miracle down here is Great Magic Barrier, which is stronger than normal Magic Barrier and good for clerics who have to run up against sorcerers a lot. PvP especially, it's nice because some people will rely way too heavily on their spells. You can cast Great Magic Barrier, make their spells do a lot less damage, and giving you the chance of surviving a lot more. Clerics in Dark Souls are always more focused on defense and self personal buffs or ally buffs that make you do more damage slightly or increase your defense a lot. There's not really a whole offensive side to clerics. There are offensive miracles. Don't get me wrong. There's various lightning attacks, which I keep saying that, but I don't have any. It's because in this game you have to um, join a certain covenant to get them. And I am not in that covenant. Maybe next time, next video, I'll have that ready. I can show you that. It's something that you can join really early. It's just you have to have either 25 faith or you have to co-op with somebody and help them like three times. Then you can get it down to 10. It goes down by five, your faith requirement does, every time you help somebody and succeed. So if you get summoned in, you help them in with one boss fight, you only need 20 faith to join. Two boss fights, 15 faith. Three boss fights, 10 faith. And it doesn't get any lower than that. Which most characters start with around 10 anyway, so it shouldn't be too hard to do. But they offer some lightning. There's emit force, which is a projectile. It's not really an element. It's, I guess, just magic damage. Wrath of the Gods is a magic damage, and there's like Grave Lord, Sword Dance, and that kind of stuff. Again, probably just magic damage. I don't know if it's physical or not. But that's kind of it for offensive miracles.
but there's offensive sorceries and offensive pyromancies and so miracles are meant more for support which is kind of sad because it's really cool lightning they have a lot of potential with in later games they kind of add more lightning but even then it may not be as strong as sorcery or pyromancy and so you're gonna notice there's bonfire here a big dragon you can pray to the everlasting dragons which puts you in the dragon covenant and you offer dragon scales to rank up in this covenant you also use dragon scales to upgrade your dragon weapons so if you do this covenant it's mostly a pvp thing you put down the dragon eye which is like a red eye orb kind of except you put down a put down a marker on the ground and people come up and they touch it and then you do a duel with them and I think whoever wins gets the dragon skill. It I don't think it matters if they're in the covenant or not or if you lose they don't get anything. I don't think it's like that. I think just whoever wins gets it. And so you can do this dragon covenant, Path of the Dragon get dragon skills to upgrade dragon weapons and then you can also turn it in for the covenant and rank up with that which will allow you to kind of look like a dragon which is kind of cool if you run behind it you can cut off the tail you get the dragon great sword right here and this needs 50 strength to use this was the one i was talking about you get a power attack that does a mystical thing I can't do it so my character just swings it around terribly and it's kind of funny but it's probably a really powerful thing I've just never really been able to use it ever I think I've done it once and it is pretty powerful it does consume durability when you use it though so you gotta be careful it's not just a hey use it forever thing but then after that, we can go back to the Daughter of Chaos. So this music really isn't going to fit. It's from Elder Scrolls Oblivion. It's nice and peaceful, though, which Dark Souls is totally not a peaceful game. And it's kind of loud and obnoxious for their music in most cases. But I figured, hey, if I'm just going to be talking, then I might as well put something peaceful in the background. So you come back here, you talk to this guy, and he gives you this egg vermifuge, which will get rid of your egg parasite on your head, and then um, you don't have to have that anymore. And now he sells toxic mist and poison mist as pyromancy, so he sells a couple extra things now. You pick up an egg vermifuge in the painted world, and he gives you one, so you should have two, and you just eat it. Now it's gone. If you're in the Dragon Covenant, you have this dragon headstone, which gives you a dragon head. There's a dragon torso stone, which gives you a dragon body that covers the rest of your body, and it's like a decent armor you get basically this kind of weird dragon skin dragon scaly look and you look more like a dragon like with the headstone here I get a longer neck I get a weird dragon face and uh, so the the dragon torso stone kind of makes the rest of the body look like the head you have to rank up in the covenant to get that and use it um, the headstone also applies this this uh, fire breathing effect and then the torso stone applies a damage buff I believe that's what it does in the other games anyway I haven't ever done it because when I did Dark Souls PvP was kinda dead and now on PC I could probably do it with DSCM but I don't really feel like doing it. There's not a huge reason for me. I guess the other important thing to note about it is that when you are ranked up, 
and you are in dragon form, your melee punches do more damage. So there are some people who have used a cheat engine script and stuff to start in this dragon form, or at least have given themselves the headstone and torso stone and been able to use them and all of that. And then that, um, they'll, they'll play through the game with that kind of character, which is pretty cool. I guess in theory you could rank up with the Covenant and then a New Game Plus play as that. But to get rid of it, you can't unequip a Dragon Head, you have to die. So I went to Firelink Shrine and I died, and then I teleported to Duke's Archives, I think, next, because I wanted to get a m large Magic Ember. That we didn't grab in there because that would have required going back to a different room. The video was getting kind of long anyway. So I was going to just kind of not have that. But now I've got a two hour long side video about boss weapons, the painted world, and Ash Lake. So, you know, I, I guess it didn't really pay off. I try to keep my videos a little shorter if I can but um, it, it's really hard with Dark Souls because there's not really a good spot to stop like okay I could stop at Painted World and get that completely done so if you're following along you're like hey look two hours or an hour and a half or whatever it happens to be I think it's usually about an hour and a half it's just too long you can stop you know anywhere in this game it's just for me I like to complete an area and to me I can waste hours playing this thing and not really realize it because it's just like it's one of those things where it's like hey just get through the next area and then you die or you get turned around or you get distracted and you start doing something else and you don't complete the area very fast and then before you know it you get two hours and now I have a two hour long recording that I kind of have to deal with. But, you know, it's a fun game. So if the boss weapon thing and Painted World was all the more you could do, come back, do the Great Hollow, whatever. Or I guess you could just skip it if it doesn't really interest you that much. But at least you can see me do it. So now the last few things I'm going to do between videos this time I went and bought everything but one of Logan's spells. You can talk to him. He sounds kind of crazy even though we can't hear the audio here and it just says mm -mm. he's actually kind of just speaking gibberish. You can't actually understand what he's saying or anything like that. It's a sign of him getting more insane. So you can talk to him again after you bought everything. He'll do the same thing. He'll tell you, hey, come again. You know, knowledge is limitless and whatever. And then if you do after you bought everything, he says, like, who are you? Get away from me. I don't know you. You're interfering my work. So he's acting all crazy again. And now, in order to get his uh, quest line ended here, you have to quit the game and reload. I tried to rest and go back, but he doesn't move. You have to quit the game and then go back to Seath's first boss fight. So I'll cut it over there. And so now we're in this room. We have Big Hat Logan attacking us naked, except with his staff, a shield, he does have a scimitar and, of course, his big hat, because why not? And he's going to try and play keep away. He's going to try and attack you with this new sorcery he's got. It's called White Dragon Breath. And you get that when you kill him. He doesn't have a lot of health, but his sorcery does do crazy damage. And you can build a character kind of like that, where you have, like, super intelligence, like, 50 or 60, and then you use this catalyst, which I believe 
increases the damage you do by a little bit, but also like halves your castings or something like that. It's it's the most powerful staff in the game, but it does something. Either halves your health or it halves castings. In every game there's something like that where it's like, "Hey, you know, it's the most powerful thing, but there's this weakness to it." Or you can use the second best thing and not have anything wrong with it. His armor can be looted from a chest in here. Not in this room, but in a different spot. I want to say it's where he was sitting. I don't remember, and I didn't grab it in this video, so I guess I'll have to try and find it. Come back here next time, too. Seems like every time I say we're done with the Duke's archives, I have to come back and grab something. Or do something. But don't forget your soul of a great hero, which is like 20,000 souls when you consume it. Now we go back. We'll give the magic blacksmith his new large magic ember, which is kind of weird because typically people get the enchanted ember before they get the large magic ember, and so the enchanted ember is supposed to be like the most super rare, super exciting one, so the magic blacksmith says something like, that is the best ember I've ever seen, it's so brilliant, I must have it, I will give you anything you want for this enchanted ember. And then for the large magic one, he's like, oh, I haven't seen that since I've been away from, like, my magic school. Give it to me so I can be useful. You know, and it's kind of weird because you get the large magic one in the Duke's archives, and you get the enchanted one from right before Sif. And you're probably going to explore Darkroot Garden before you explore the Duke's archives. So, it's kind of weird, but... In any case, we'll go back to him, we'll give it to him, and now you can make your weapons up to max. We had a weird gap, because we got the enchanted ember first, we were able to take a weapon at plus 5 and make it magic, and then we were able to make it magic plus 5. From there, we could take the weapon and make it enchanted plus 5, but we couldn't make it magic plus 6 through 10. Giving him the large magic ember will allow us to make the magic weapon, or any magic weapon you have, at plus 5, up to plus 6, plus 7, 8, 9, and 10. And either the enchanted version at plus 5, or the magic version at plus 10 requires a blue titanite slab. And in case you don't want to spend resources making a magic upgraded thing you get an enchanted falchion from a mimic in the duke's archives and so you can kind of undo the enchanted part and it'll be a magic plus five falchion and then you uh you can put that to plus six through ten and eventually max that out if you wanted I think the last thing I do here is I also bought this guy's stuff. He said he was going to sell me Master Logan's sorceries and stuff. So I went ahead and bought all that. And now you can talk to him. And he's just like, oh, I want to find Master Logan. My reasons are my own. But he told us after he sold us everything, he was going to go back on his journey and look for him. Which we know he's hollow and dead. This guy doesn't. So he's going to go head off and try to find him. At this point, if you've bought all his stuff, he should go hollow at some point in Sen's Fortress. I think you find him where you found Logan originally. Somewhere in Sen's Fortress, anyway, you find him. And you can kill him there. I don't think he drops anything special. So there's really no reason to go do that. So now we're approaching the end of the video here, just a couple more minutes. I'm going to put on 
my rusted iron ring. That'll hopefully remind me to go get my pyromancy flame upgraded before I do this next video. And we're going to be here at the Fair Lady. We need to give her 30 humanity if you want to save Solaire. You don't have to. Solaire, he can only be summoned for one more fight, and that's the final boss fight in the game. So if you think you're going to need him for the final boss fight, you should try and get 30 humanity and give it to her. This will put you as Chaos Servant Rank 2, which allows us access to this shortcut to Lost Isolith. And I will show that in the next video. And if you access the shortcut before you kill a certain boss, then Solaire will be saved. If you don't and don't do what you need to do, Solaire will be hollow and we'll have to fight him and we'll get his stuff. So take your pick and uh, thank you for watching. I hope everything was helpful.